Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study. I was thinking this morning about a couple of radio preachers I used to listen to when I was a young pastor. I'm talking in like 22 years old. I was uh, working uh, for a uh, plumbing supply house, and I was able to... I worked back in the back in the warehouse, so I was able to have my transistor radio hung up on a nail in the middle of the warehouse, <laughs> on uh, and I could turn it to K No, is it K A J N? Was the was the radio um, station, and it was of course a Christian station. I remember listening to Kenneth. Hagen Sr., he's now gone. And I remember listen, listening to another pastor, I don't remember his name, but his program was the Southwest Radio Church of the Air. The Southwest Radio Church of the Air. And he would, he would open his broadcast and he would say good morning and he would say, God's still on the throne and prayer changes things. <laughs> And uh, then there was a local pastor in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Uh, there's a large Assembly of God church in Lake Charles, still there, and, and back years ago, Glad Tidings, Assemblies of God. But right next door was the, I believe it was the Lake Charles Bible Church, but that might not have been the name, but the pastor's name was Brother Howard Holt, and he was an older fella. And I really liked his teaching because he was a classic, charismatic. He wasn't denominational. And I really, that's a, a, a characteristic teaching style and approach to the scriptures that just about doesn't exist anymore uh, in the charismatic renewal. And, uh, but he always started, he had a speech impediment. And so he always started his broadcast with this little saying, but he sounded like he had a mouth full of marbles. <laughs> and he would say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God into salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. <laughs> and then he'd say, and with those familiar words, <laughs> wow. he's no doubt he's in heaven today because he was an older fella back then. Of course, back then I figured if you were 35, you had one foot in the grave, you know. I'm 57 now, and I laugh. I counsel with people uh, all the time. We get phone calls from all over the world. People fly in to do mentoring weekends with us, and they're in their 40s, or they're coming up on 40, and they're just so stressed out, thinking life is over. Mm -hmm. They, You know, the, the day is far spent, and I am undone. I'm about to turn 40, and I haven't done anything with my life. And I just laugh. I said, you're just, you're just a pup. You're just a kid. My eldest son will be 40 in just a few uh, years. I think I want to uh, take out an ad like they do sometimes and put up a baby picture. Lordy, lordy, put a, who's 40? Put a baby picture of Russ Jr. Uh, in the Clinton <laughs> Daily Democrat. <laughs> but uh, my dad went to heaven last year. He's 83 years old, and I would... I would make statements like that at 57, and he'd say, oh, boy, you're still wet behind the ears. You're not even 60 yet. And so today we are studying Mark chapter 8. Moving right along, aren't we, on the New we Testament? Are, and guess what? We're working now. We're, we yeah. have initiated the publishing process to get our prophetic perspective commentary published for the book of Matthew. And from now on, that's how it's going to be. When we complete a book, we're going to compile it and publish it and have it available in paperback on Amazon as quickly as possible. Thank God for Ken Allen, Ken Allen. who does oh, our, yes, uh, our editing for us, one of the employees of the ministry. Um, he's also <clears throat> training to be a pilot. God's given us a vision to have a plane for the ministry when we didn't know we'd have a 1,200-mile commute from Green Valley, mm -hmm. Arizona to Branson, Branson, Missouri. And so I believe 
that you do what you can do with what you have and stick with it. And if you're waiting for your ship to come in, that's a form of deception. You have to do what you can. Do now what you say you would do when your ship comes in. So, well, we, we don't have a, a, a Gulf Stream sitting out there on the tarmac at the local airport, but we do have a pilot in training, so pray with us that we'll have, a, Kitty says, uh, airplane to wrap around our pilot an airplane to wrap around our pilot. <laughs> and Ken also, and working for the ministry, one of the things he does is he edits uh, the teachings as we do them. And, Glory. Uh, believing Jesus for everyday <clears throat> needs. In chapter 8 of Mark, Jesus again multiplies the loaves and the fishes. He fed 5,000 previously. He feeds 4,000 today. The disciples, however, have not learned the lesson of God's provisioning, and they become concerned shortly thereafter because they forgot to pack lunch for a journey. Have you ever been slow to learn the lessons of the faithfulness of God? Let me help you with that today. This chapter is a repeated reminder that no matter what you are short of, God has demonstrated in Christ his willingness and ability to meet our everyday need. I don't know how people can read chapters like this and say God expects you to take care of the small things because surely one meal is not going to kill anybody, the lack thereof, but yet Jesus so demonstrably got involved in everyday needs that you eat that meal and it's gone, but yet he, God loves us so much he saw to it that even those things get addressed in our lives. So it's 38 verses, Mark chapter 8. Let's read Sister Kitty, if you would, <laughs> through verse 21 to start off. Sister Lovey Dovey. <clears throat> Sister Lovey Dovey Honey Bunny Schnookums. That's her theological ecclesiastical title at yes, Father's Heart Ministry. Verse 1. In those days the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him and said unto them, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now been with me three days and have had nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way, for divers of them came from far. And his disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? And he asked them, I'm sorry, and he asked them, How many loaves have you? And they said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and break and gave to his disciples to set before them. And they did set them before the people. And they had a few small fishes. And he blessed and he commanded to set them also before them. So they did eat, they did eat and were filled. And they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets. And they that had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. And straightway he entered into a ship with his disciples and came into the parts of Dalmanutha. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question him, question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven and tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why doth Doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. And he left them, and entering into the ship again, departed to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have... It is because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye, because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand? Have you your hearts yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not? And having ears, hear ye not? And do not do, do ye not remember? And when I break the bread, the five loaves among the five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took you up? And they said, Twelve. And when the seven among the four thousand, how many baskets full took ye up? And they said, Seven. And he said unto them, How is it that you do not understand? And I remember chapter seven closed out with Jesus putting spittle on a man's tongue. And uh, a deaf man was healed. 
And then the crowd becomes very large over the course of three days, and Jesus has compassion on them because they have nothing to eat. Can, can you imagine? You know, traditionally, you know, we go to church, and, uh, you know, the joke is that the pastor was preaching, and it was a little after 12 o'clock, and the deacon was sitting in the back saying, DQ, DQ. <laughs> and uh, the pastor kept on preaching even more fiery, and it was 1245 before he let out. And the deacon, about every few minutes, was saying, DQ, DQ. And uh, afterwards, the deacon comes up, didn't you hear me? He said, well, yeah, you were saying DQ, DQ. And he said, yeah, DQ, Dairy Queen. Oh, dear. And he said, oh, I thought you were saying don't quit. <laughs> so the, the point being, you know, do you ever feel that, that restlessness when it gets up around noon and it's lunchtime Sunday morning and you're thinking it's a good service, but I'm, I'm ready for a meal. Got my crock pot on at home. Nice roast waiting on the family. <laughs> and here they are three days, three days. Can you imagine going to church on Sunday morning and it's... Wednesday afternoon, and uh, you're importuned because you're not where you could get some food. And uh, he tells the disciples that it's not practical to send the people away uh, without feeding them. And uh, and it's interesting now, when he fed the 5,000, they were saying, man, where are we going to get 200 penny worth of bread? But here they're not concerned about not having enough money. There's no mention of, what are you talking about? We don't have money. No, that was not the problem. They had the money, but the problem was they didn't have access. There was out in this remote place where they could get enough to feed 4,000 people. And so what does that imply? Now listen, this is important. Jesus' ministry was not without its means. See, there's indication that not only was Jesus able to provide for himself and 12 men and their families... Now, can you imagine you have 12 men and it's very unlikely that these men were all single. It's very possible they were all had wives and children. And, uh, and so here Jesus is saying that you come follow me and they walked away from their businesses and Jesus putting his faith out there was taken care of. And we know from other places in scripture that he was supported by wealthy women, by people that appreciated who he was, what he was. And he also cared for the poor because when Judas went out, they, the mm -hmm. other disciples thought he was going to go do something for the poor. So he was taking care of his guys. He was taking care of the poor. And apparently they had enough money on hand. They could have fed the 4,000, but there was nowhere to find a vendor on with enough bread to feed that many. Now, can you imagine? You've got a meeting with 4,000 people, <laughs> and, and all of a sudden you realize that uh, they need to be fed, and you've got enough money on hand in petty cash to buy 4,000 uh, Happy Meals or whatever. And just think, think about that. So Jesus' ministry was not broke. So why do we want ministries to be broke? I just want a preacher who's going to be like Jesus. Okay, well, you know, then he's not going to be a broke preacher. And he, neither is he going to be wearing threads because Jesus was so well-dressed that when the Romans crucified him, they say, hey, let's not mess that garment up. Let's hang on to that. Mm -hmm. So Jesus was also well-dressed. Imagine that. Mm -hmm. So... What do you do with the vow of poverty? Come on, the vow, it's like a vow to you, Satan. You break it. <laughs> you make a vow to poverty, you pl place a premium on poverty, that is making a vow to Satan himself. That's you might true. as well draw a pentagram on your forehead yeah, and go bow down to the devil somewhere. Break it off. We need to, but yet the church is deeply bound. One of the significant characteristics of the church is this sickening, obscene, nauseating attitude towards finance really needs to change. Let it start with you. Amen. So they can't requisition bread from a local provider, so Jesus says, well, what do you got? It's like, remember the woman with the issue of blood? She said, if I can, I will. Her faith, the faith that brought her miracle, was not something she couldn't do, it's what something, it was something she could do. It's like Peter. Peter couldn't walk on the water, but what he could do is throw himself over the rail. Don't you think it's time to, to leap over the rail? 
You're sitting back waiting. I'm just waiting on a miracle. I'm just believing. Well, leap over the rail. You can't walk on water, but you can leap over the rail. What's wrong with you? And so he's not asking for what they don't have. He's saying, let's look at what you do have. What do you have? To have enough faith to give Jesus your little lunch. So he takes these loaves and fishes and he distributes it to the crowd and winds up with seven baskets. When they fed the 5,000, they had 12 baskets left over. They have seven baskets left over. Now, if God in Christ will take such a small amount of resources and multiply it to meet the needs of so many in such a miraculous way, listen, it's not a stretch of your faith to see God working in the course of your everyday lives to bless you in your going out and your coming in day by day. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but how does that work? Okay, I remember I needed uh, $600 plus, about $653 to pay a tax bill that was due, and the money was due the next day, and I was concerned about it, and God kept telling me, look in your wallet. I look in my wallet, my, my wallet was empty. And all day long, God kept saying, look in your wallet, look in your wallet. And I, you know, what are you going to do, God? You know, plant, tell the angel to plant some 20s. Uh, uh, and I just kept looking, and, and the Lord kept telling me, look in your wallet. And finally, I took my wallet and tore my wallet apart and took everything out of my wallet that I could possibly find there. And lo and behold, out of a little back area of my wallet dropped six $100 bills. <laughs> now, God's not a counterfeiter, okay? Although he can do anything he wants anytime he wants and doesn't have to check with anybody. Okay. But what it was, earlier that year, I had been on my way to lunch and somebody came in and made a purchase in my business. And I was in such a hurry to get out to another appointment that I just took the money, stuck it in my wallet, locked the door, and went out. And I wasn't going to keep it for myself. It had to go in the till of my business, so I put it not where I would normally put money. And so Kitty and I have a saying, where's all the money going to Now say that. Say that with me. Where's all the money going to come from? Where's all the money going to come from? From wherever it is at the time. From wherever it is at the time. And where is the money? Where's the money? It's right where you need it to right be. Right where you need it to be. Mm -hmm. Come on now. Mm -hmm. And how many times, Kitty? Yeah, many times. Many, 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 many times that that's come about. So there are miracles that happen around us at times that we don't even notice God's hand at work. We could say, oh, that's just a coincidence. Oh, no. Is it now? So God so loved that he gave. His most basic nature is that of a giver. So the person that says sometimes God answers prayer, but sometimes he says no, that person is shaking his fist in the face of the giving nature of God. That person is repudiating between clenched teeth, John three sixteen. God so loved that he said no. That's a lie. That's a lie. God will never say no to what the cross says yes to. We need to get that in our heads. And so God loves and provides for us in great ways and small. I remember, Katie, tell about uh, you were frustrated and the Lord said, well, how do you think about this when you were on the lake? Oh, gosh, I was frustrated about a job situation. I had a supervisor who was not um, acting Christ-like, and it was really disturbing. And the Lord said, how do you like this lakefront? I'm sitting in front of the lake. And how do you like this lakefront I provided for? For you, isn't it lovely? And boy, that caught me up quick. And I repented of being cranky and complaining to God about something minor to him because he wanted me to focus on the bigger picture. So we just have to trust him. Can you imagine about like these 4,000 people <laughs> sitting down with empty stomachs? Can you imagine that? If you had a great need, think about a need represented by not eating for three days. You got your kids with you. You got your wife or your spouse with you. Well, wait, man, we got to do something. Look at my watch. You know, don't have good cell phone coverage. Can't call Papa John. So we, hey, we <laughs> Jesus, appreciate it, but it, we got to do something. No, he said, no, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Sit down. Just have enough faith to sit down 
in a remote place. Mm -hmm. Just just sit down and receive from God. So Jesus, after he feeds the 4,000, he sends them away. And uh, he then boards a ship. And he goes to down in Utha. Now when he gets there, and if you notice in Mark, up to this point, every time the Pharisees show up, Jesus heads the other way. The Pharisees come asking a sign from heaven, some proof of his authority. And Jesus' evidence is, his, his frustration is evidence. You know, he, he, he just sighs within himself. <sighs> you knuckleheads. He's probably thinking that. He sighed within himself and he says, no, no sign shall be given them. Do we have sign seekers today? We see this sign-seeking mentality among us even now. Non-believers challenge us with questions that begin with, if you call yourself a Christian, you'll do thus and so. And you know, most Christians are just slain by that. They just don't, they get a knot in the pit of their stomach and they don't know how to answer it. Why? Because they've got the same spirit of challenge and skepticism in them that they're being confronted with. Mm -hmm. Notice that Jesus never felt compelled. No, not going to do that. He never felt compelled to do anything about that. Why, why do we get so disconcerted when we get challenged by unbelief, by skeptical unbelievers? Jesus just says, no, I'm not going to do that. And, you know, believers challenge people that move in the prophetic. They say, well, if this prophecy is of God, I've heard this taught. Among names in the prophetic that are household names, they say if you don't give a word of knowledge and a prophetic word, then it's not of God. That's an absolute lie. That's a sign seeker. He said, if, well, if you don't tell me something about myself that no one else could possibly know, listen, that's nothing more than asking a prophetic minister to act like a psychic or give a palm reading. It doesn't take any faith. We need to grow up in the prophetic. It takes no faith to believe in a word given that tells you what your social security number is and what the name of your second cousin twice removed is. Listen, what, don't tell me it takes faith to believe that. It takes no faith. And whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So people want to receive a prophetic word, but they don't want to be called out of their sin and their skepticism. Attitudes th towards such things require no faith at all. And guess what? We need to, the Bible says believe the prophets. That means they don't have to pull a rabbit out of their hat. They don't have to do the dog and pony show of some word of knowledge that requires no faith on the person's part. We need to grow up. Well, the Bible says that they'll fall down and report God is in you. Yeah, that's unbelievers. The only person where a word of knowledge can legitimately be given <clears throat> as a proof of the validity of a prophetic word is somebody who needs to get born again. Mm -hmm. So the next time you find yourself saying, well, he's prophesying according to knowledge. I don't know if that's God or not. He didn't tell me something I, I didn't already know. And uh, if you're not saying that, then you, we need to just say, well, are we believing the prophets or not? To demand a word of knowledge is not fulfilling Second Chronicles 2020, and then we wonder why the prophecy doesn't prosper us. Mm -hmm. So that's my stump. Uh, Jesus leaves by ship again, and it seems every time the Pharisees show up, Jesus is calling the travel agent. Is that your response? Or do you continue in relationship with religious skeptics as though you're actually going to change their mind? Trying to convince. I never feel compelled to convince anybody. Mm -hmm. Jesus is always moving away from unbelief without any apparent compunction to answer their criticisms or their lack of spiritual understanding. And in one place, Paul made the statement. He said, and if you have the same attitude, they will consider that an evident token of your perdition. Why? Don't you walk away from me. <laughs> Sorry. I got somewhere, somewhere else to be. Don't waste your breath. Jesus said in another place, let the blind lead the blind. And the dead if, bury the dead. If they don't get it, they don't get it. Keep on moving. There's a whole world full of lost people out mm -hmm. there. Amen. So just keep going. So they get on another ship, and then the next thing that happens, 
is the disciples get concerned because they didn't pack a lunch. They had one loaf, and that would not be enough to feed 13 men. And Jesus, seeing that they're concerned about food, he says something. He's really trying to get their mind off of that. He says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, what does leaven do? I want you to think about this. I saw something here I've never seen before. Jesus is multiplying the bread. What does leaven do? Does it not multiply bread? Mm -hmm. It causes dough to rise. It, in effect, increases bread without increasing its actual substance. It's like people who have uh, nothing to say seem to take a long time to say it. It's the leaven of the Pharisees. However, Jesus, he also increases bread. But when he does so, there is substance in life in that which he enlarges. The disciples really aren't paying attention, however, because it's like whenever we used to cater our meetings, and then one year we decided not, not to cater our meetings, and people would come and say, I'm hungry. <laughs> And you'll hear a cooling fan go off. Our computers decided to do something in terms of cooling it down. So never mind that. The, so they're not paying attention. And Jesus rebukes them for being distracted by their need for food and the lack of it in the ship. And he reminds them of feeding the 5,000 when 12 baskets were left over, the 4,000 when 7 baskets were left over. And he marvels after seeing such miracles that they don't understand. Why do you not understand? What was it they were not understanding? Not understanding that God will meet their needs no matter what the natural situation or lack of resources happens to be. So here is a point. This is like a pet peeve Jesus has. He has a pet peeve with sign seekers and he has a pet peeve with his guys when they could not trust God beyond an empty stomach or beyond, in our case, beyond an empty bank account beyond some lack in our life. I, I, well, I can't go there. Have you ever frustrated the grace of God in this way? Uh, I remember after years of faithful provision that God took me, he literally sat me down, took me through a list of miracle after miracle <laughs> after miracle. And basically what he said to me, he says, you don't even need a Bible, Russ, to prove my faithfulness. <laughs> You've got a track record of years of faithfulness, and I did this, and I did this, and I did this, and, 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 he, and he was asking me, he said, I did that, right? Yeah, God, that was you, hallelujah, praise God. And then he says in the, to me, then in the light of such blessing, how come I have to spend 30 minutes getting past your unbelief every time I want to have a conversation with you? And then he went on to tell me, he says, son, lose the habit of unbelief. You ever have your kids do that? You know, your little ones, you perfectly plan on doing something for them, but they think they're in trouble. And they come up, and you were going to take them out for ice cream. But Bubby and Sissy were doing it too, you know. And uh, But all you were wanting to do is bless them. I think we approach God that way. We approach God. God with this sense of consternation trying to get past our fear and you know I love you Jesus he said look would you please just dispense with all of that <laughs> and just trust me I took care of you most of us we, if we didn't even have a bible we'd have circumstances in our life we know God came through for us just like one time God told Denise uh, our best friend used to work for us God told her and said hey lose the attitude <laughs> you can do that. sometimes we just need to hear that don't we verse 22 through the end of the chapter okay. and he cometh to Bethesda and bring, they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him and he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him he asked him if he saw aught or anything and he looked up and said I see men as trees walking after that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house, saying, Neither go into town, nor tell anyone in the town. 
And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others one of the prophets. And he said unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he spake that saying openly, and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he saith unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. And whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed, and when he cometh, when he cometh into the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So after arriving in Bethsaida, a blind man asks to touch Jesus. Now the man apparently believes that if he touches Jesus, he will be whole. And his blind eyes open, but that is not what happens. Now, how many of you have an idea, if I can just, if God will just cooperate with how I think this needs to happen? But that's not what happened, because Jesus does touch the guy, and he doesn't get healed. And a lot of people, their faith dies right there. We have an idea of how God, if I can just, if God will just... And then when God doesn't do that, that, oh, well, you know. And there's lots of preachers out there that'll say, yeah, well, God always answers prayer. Sometimes he says no. If this man had acted that way, after failing to receive his miracle, when he thought, if I can just touch him. Now, can you imagine? Jesus reaches out. He, Jesus takes him by the hand. And when Jesus took the man by the hand, he expected in that instance for his eyes to be open. It didn't happen. But what does Jesus do? He starts tugging on him, leading him out of town. He can't see. He starts taking you somewhere you can't see. Mm-hmm. Oh, God, did you just move in my job? Did you just move in my marriage? Oh, God. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God starts tugging on you and taking you somewhere you can't see. And he's not solving your problem. How many of us, our faith just dies right there? The man, no doubt, thought when Jesus took his hand that his eyes would be open, but instead Jesus leads him. It's, and we can only assume. Now, let's assume Jesus could have healed him, but didn't. Well, then Jesus would be saying, hold on now. I know what you want. Come with me. How about that? What if, on the other hand, it was like Jesus in Nazareth where it said he could not do many miracles in Nazareth? Maybe that's, so, okay, you want a miracle. Let me lead you to where that's going to take place. Oh, no, wait a minute. I don't want to be led. <laughs> it's like I've, to, when I was a pastor. I might tell you why I'm not a pastor of a traditional church anymore. People would come down to the altar. We were getting major miracles. Cancers being healed. People were getting radical miracles. And then the Lord began dealing with me because there were a bunch of people in the church who were on disability and they would come down for healing. And one day the Lord just says, here's how I want you to do this. And I came down for healing in church, about 300, 350 people. And say, what what do you want? Oh, I want God to heal me. I said, if God heals you, will you call the Social Security Administration and give up your disability? No. I said, then go sit down. You're not ready to be healed yet. Hello. In other words, not being willing to be led. And I uh, said, so, well, that wasn't a very nice thing to do. Yeah, well, Jack Coe pulled 60 people out of uh, 
uh, wheelchairs at one time, and 10 of them laid on the ground, and the other 50 got healed. And he looked at the 10 laying on the ground and said, you don't have any faith. Are you listening? Mm -hmm. We need to get past this perverted sense of Christian conscience that Jesus never demonstrated in his ministry. So what do you do? When you go through the motions to what you think ought to produce your answer and it doesn't come, what do you do? Give up? No, you need to listen to God very closely when it seems your answer is not forthcoming. I've seen people turn their back and go the other way Mm -hmm. because God, not only did God not answer them, but he was not acting on their timetable. We need to listen to God very closely when it seems our answers are not forthcoming. Religion today, if this guy, if this kid was an evangelical, he just would have shrugged his shoulders. Yeah, my pastor said sometimes God always answers prayer. Sometimes he says, no, I'll just bear my cross, Jesus. Jesus, I'll just be blind and, and for your greater glory. Isn't that what we get taught? Isn't that nauseating? Isn't that obscene? Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, hey, fella, if you'll just stop talking long enough to listen to my leading, I'm going to take you where your miracle is going to take place. But religion, they just shrug their shoulders. They presume healing is not for them. To this man's credit, however, he allows himself to be led to a place where after some process, he got healed. Now, that's another thing. Okay, Lord, I let you lead me here, and I'm here, and, and I, 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 that's it. I got no more patience. I want what I want. It's like, you know, mm-hmm. taking candy bar away from a baby. I want what I want. I take candy bar away from my middle son, and he just throw himself down on the floor and buck until he got what he wanted. And, and how many times? And then what did Jesus do? He worked with the guy. He, he, he worked with him and says, can you see now? H- how's it looking? How about now? How about now? It's like when you go to the... <laughs> God taught me something about the prophetic. When you go get your glasses and they put that device in front of you and they start switching lenses. I say, how does this look? How about now? How about now? People so don't understand the prophetic. See, God will dial in your miracle if you'll just cooperate with them. Be willing to be led even when your prayers seemingly are not being answered. And then, okay, I got it. Thank you so much. Wait, 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 where are you going? Oh, I'm I'm headed back to town. Uh Uh-uh. He said, don't you go back into that town in another place. He said, don't you go back in that town unless something worse comes upon you. Now think about that. Can you imagine being told this by someone who just prayed for your healing? Would you be capable of that level of obedience or would common sense? Well, now, Jesus, you got to have common sense. I left my car back there in the parking lot. My wife and kids are in that town. And Jesus said, don't you even go back in that city limit. Would you be capable? What if a minister told you that? What if a minister laid hands on you, you got your miracle, and he says, now, you you cannot go home. You cannot go back into that town. Don't you dare go back. You just get all some friends, get them to bring your stuff out. Don't you dare go back there the rest of your life. Can you imagine? Well, I appreciate it, preacher, but common sense dictates some things. That's the problem with that phrase. Common sense is just common. It's (laughs) not God. (laughs) Learn to obey God and be led by God even when it isn't convenient. And even when prayers seemingly go unanswered. That is the key to your miracle. So in verses 27 through 29, Jesus then shifts the scene and he asks his disciples who they thought he was. And if you're paying attention to this in Matthew over and again, he's, he's, it's not like he didn't know who he was, but he was trying to deal with their belief in reincarnation. They had this idea, this superstitious idea, uh, just like Herod, that they thought he was Elijah come to life, or the recently deceased John the Baptist resurrected. Are we doing that now? Who's the next Billy Graham? It's the same attitude people have. Well, he's got that Billy Graham mantle on his life. Well, he's got this on his life. 
Am I saying there's no validity to some of that thinking? I, but I think sometimes we're making the same mistake. And, and Jesus said, look, quit worrying about who Billy Graham is and start thinking about who I am. You know, we're trying to get impressed, trying to get in front of this minister or that minister. Jesus said that. They'll say, lo, here is Christ. Lo, there is Christ. Oh, there's an anointing down there in Pensacola. We'll go down there now. And that's not going to be what you see. We went, did we not? We went. Not criticizing them folks, but whatever was happening there before, it ain't happening there now. I know a lot of people going to North Carolina because they think God's doing something there, and I have yet to meet anybody that has been to North Carolina that wasn't disappointed. A lot of people going to Reading. I've talked to a lot of folks. Man, God is really doing something powerful in Reading. But I also know by a lot of people I have ministered to who went to Reading, I know why Reading originally was named Poverty Flats. Are you listening to me? So who do you say I am? <laughs> Now, what happens next? You notice that in this story, Matthew said that at this point when, G when Peter declares who Jesus was, that Jesus turned and said, and you are my rock, and I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. Peter leaves that out. Ah, impetuous Peter. <laughs> what do you mean Peter leaves it out? I thought Mark wrote this. Remember, the gospel of Mark constitutes Peter's Jesus stories. As Mark was the traveling companion of Peter who wrote these things in Rome after Peter's execution. See, the Gospel of Mark is basically the 12 cassette volume of all of Peter's preaching that he did from place to place where he went. You'll find that in traveling ministers. Listen, they're not coming up with a new word every day. They just pretty much don't do that. They have a set of words that they preach and Mark, traveling with Peter, had heard him preach these things over and over and over again. The Gospel of Mark is comprised of Peter's Jesus stories. And so it's really interesting that Peter leaves out the part of Jesus giving him the keys of the kingdom. Why did he do that? Humility. You see the difference? Peter's telling, telling on himself for rebuking Jesus and Jesus calling him the devil. But he left the other part out tells us something about Peter's character. It tells us something about his maturity that apparently Mark didn't know that part of the story. Isn't that interesting? Mark di didn't mention that. You'd think if he knew about it, he would have said it. But Peter traveled with John Mark for many years and never told Mark that Jesus had given him the keys. Man, we... <laughs> We get a hangnail healed. We're beaming it around the world by satellite. But that's not the way Peter did in his maturity as an apostle. So Jesus, then he calls the people together to teach them, and he declares, hey, whosoever will follow me, let him deny himself and take up the cross. Yes, I'm carrying the cross. At the risk of seeming harsh, I, I just got to make the point. Joni Erickson Tata believes she's a quadriplegic because that's her cross to bear. Is that true? If that's true, then God will say no at times to what the cross says yes to because he said he's our healer. And that we might get a miracle, we might not. It's the ineffable character of God. He might make good on his promise, he might not. As though if we don't receive a miracle, somehow that it, that reason we're not receiving a miracle can only originate in God. But yet we know from studying the Old Testament right down to what we're studying today that every time this was talked about, and even Jesus when he talked about it, it said he marveled at their unbelief. Not for one minute did he say, well, you know. How come? See, he speaks to us by his son. Hebrews chapter 1 says, in these days God is speaking to us by his son. And did Jesus ever say, uh, nope, not going to heal you? You're, you're supposed to have the, you're supposed to have the, even the guy who said he's lame from his mother, did, did this man sin or his, or his parents sin? And people always bring that up as a justification for why people don't get healed and they forget the fact that Jesus said it in the act of healing the man. And so think about, think about this. What is your key said unless you take up your cross, that's what he said. Your cross. 
But he didn't say unless you take up the cross or my cross. See, people are trying to take up the cross of Christ. You can't take up the cross of Christ. If you think you're going to take up the cross of Christ, this mock piety, that is the most obscenely arrogant concept that you could ever imagine. That is a Pharisee squared who thinks that they're going to carry the cross of Christ. He did not say, unless you take up my cross. Listen, there's only one Jesus. We err as followers of Jesus when we think we're going to take up Jesus' cross. There is only one Jesus. You can't carry anybody's sin but your own. You can't carry sickness and disease. Now, be honest. Don't lift your hand. I couldn't stand it. But how many of you have had some, a loved one and they're sick and they're in a bad situation and you start praying, God, whatever it takes, take me, God, take me. What an obscenely arrogant statement. Mm -hmm. That's suggesting that somehow we have to impugn God with being unwilling to answer. The only motivator, the only thing that could ever satisfy divine justice was the sinless Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. But somehow we think that we're going to convince God to do something as in what we're completely overlooking is our own sinful state. That all of those things could be in our life. You could have all of those things in your life and it could just be the consequence of sin. You can only carry your cross. You think about that. And your cross is always going to be connected with the claims of Christ on your life. What does it cost you to do what God has called you to do? I know for Kitty and I, we have two children that we are estranged from and have been estranged from for 10 years. And grandchildren that we can't have in our life. Because our children would not have us in their life unless we repudiated our faith, unless we repudiated our call. Well, guess what? That's a cross for us to bear. It's the cost that is exacted because you're walking with God. And you know what? We could have very easily said, oh, no, 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 we, 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 want, we want to have the grandkids this weekend. We were gonna, they were going to spend the night this weekend. We, we'll give in to whatever you want. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. No way. Please, please forgive me. Don't, don't not let me see the grandkids. See, unless you deny yourself, and that word self is suke, unless you deny your mind, your will, your emotions, oh, that's not what I want, God. Yeah, you have to deny your will. This doesn't feel good. You have to deny your emotions. This doesn't make sense. I've seen believers weeping tears. If I only understood, they're not denying their suke, their mind, their soul. And taking up their cross, it just doesn't make sense, I'm going to do it. Doesn't feel too good, I'm going to do it. Not really what I want, but I'm going to do it anyway. Amen. That is your cross. And most Christians have no concept. Jesus is just a little dashboard Jesus, a little condiment that people salt into their life to make the life they choose to live more palatable. And that is the essence of the seeker-sensitive Jesus and how church gets done today. And we're being trounced in the world because we have not taken up our cross and followed him. And there's one thing about being crucified with Christ that you can't fake your own death until you stop wiggling on that altar. You're not dead. And we press in until we are completely free to obey the Lord. Father, thank you for the very privilege of following hard after you. We want to be led by you. We know you left us precious Holy Spirit to help lead, guide, and direct us. So today we take a leap of faith into our next journey, the next thing you have us to do, and we leap by faith in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.